Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Math Magic Motivating and Outcome Based Activities to Inspire Learners. The focus today is going to be heavily on how to make math engaging, highly motivating, so that the activity itself is inspiring for the learner, increasing the motivation and the engagement, which is what we are looking for in students with uh, multiple and severe disabilities or moderate to severe disabilities. And then that leads to desired outcomes for the student. So what exactly are we going to be looking at at this webinar? We are going to see how do we enable our learners with the learning challenges that may be cognitive challenges, communication challenges, and motor, uh, motor needs, motor challenges. How do we make math learning accessible to them? We are going to be looking at a number of core concepts in the area of mathematics. And we want to make those activities as functional as possible so that it has real life application for our students. But at the same time, we want to use the activities as a medium to engage the learner. And we want to make sure frequently, for example, what happens is math is considered somewhat abstract. While we heavily focus on literacy-based activities, we tend to think of math much more either as a num number sense or operations and may not look at all the core concepts, though I think that's increasing now that we are looking at a lot more on the core concepts. But how do we use these core concepts to reach the learner? How do we adjust the task uh, uh, challenge level, and how do we use novel and diverse activities? That's what we are going, I'm going to be sharing at this uh, webinar. And all of these activities are based on the Universal Design for Learning. Those of you who have joined me previously in, in my webinars, uh, the last one I spent a lot of time focusing on the Universal Design for Learning principle, which uh, provides access. And I'm going to touch on that again a little bit for those of you who are joining uh, this webinar for the first time, um, uh, this series of webinars, I mean. And we are also going to look at how we can embed technology a support to students uh, with significant uh, needs, severe or uh, multiple uh, challenges, learning challenges. Those of you who are joining me for the first time, um, I am an author and an educational consultant, and I have written a number of books. And uh, this webinar is heavily uh, adapted from one of my books focusing on severe and multiple disabilities. Uh, you know, as the slide shows, I also have books on autism and paraeducator training program and early childhood books. Uh, as you see, some of the books, pictures are presented there, and the one with the serving students with severe and multiple disabilities have hundreds and hundreds of uh, activities as well as support ideas with illustrations. This one is a toolkit. It's um, uh, a treasure house, you could say, for a beginner a learner uh, in this field of severe and multiple disabilities. And it has a lot of adapted material to make uh, that teachers, educators, and therapists can use uh, to increase engagement of learners. I do want to mention at this time, for those of you who have joined me this morning, um, or maybe noon in some in the Eastern time zone, this particular webinar is 
for uh, at the beginner level. So some of these things you may already be doing, and so it will validate your practice. And for those of you who are at the beginner level, I think it will give you lots and lots of ideas to transform and make your instru instruction transformative. So at the very beginning, it is important for us to know where our learners Stand. What are their characteristics? What are their strengths? What are their needs? Because it is important to realize as we plan our in instruction that generalizing may be difficult for students with significant cognitive difficulties. While they may demonstrate their proficiency with a certain type of material or type of instruction, when you take that some same instruction or same task to a different setting, they may have difficulty. So it's important uh, right at the beginning for me to mention that we have to try and use a variety of settings in order to make sure our student is proficient in the task that we think or in, the, in mastering the concept. And for students who have very severe and profound uh, uh, cognitive impairment, they are really at the stage of an object awareness that the objects kind of exist separately from themselves. So you are still teaching that. So I am hoping that some of these techniques that I'm sharing with you today will also enable you to increase that student's object awareness. And some of the adaptations and supports that will be shared will also help students who have uh, visual impairment or severe motor impairment uh, or physical mobility issues because our goal is to involve all students with severe and multiple disabilities in effective and more efficient type of learning. And this is a chart that you may have seen before when you participated in the literacy uh, webinar. But uh, what I want to mention is um, the previous slide we talked about understanding the learner's strengths and needs. So it is very important to focus on as we make the adaptations on the learner's needs. What kind of, um, am I going to create an adapted counting book with concrete materials? Uh, am I going to take advantage of real life situations? Am I going to take advantage of acting, uh, uh, role play and drama to teach? Uh, does the student need something to touch concrete materials because the student is either visually impaired or learns uh, the learner preference is for tactile materials. And so those are some adaptations we need to be constantly looking at in terms of the individual student. And then the other important thing, especially for a learner with most significant needs, is we have to blend the academic curriculum activities, the core concepts, with functional activities so that it has long-term benefit for the student because we have to be constantly asking, do we have the end in mind? Are we looking at the student at the end of the year, at the end of three years, at the end of five years, where do we want to prepare the student for the future? How are we going to prepare? And one of the things that I do want to mention here is monitoring the student's progress. You have to have some kind of a system in place, and most, I think most educators do have a system in place to monitor the student's progress. And uh, one of the ways is to use some kind of a data probe so that after you have instructed the student on a particular concept, you are evaluating to see how far the student has gained uh, in terms of comprehending the concept and is is he gaining confidence in demonstrating his or her understanding of the concept? But it's also important at this stage as you're monitoring the progress is what kind of a prompt hierarchy are you using? If you are using mostly physical prompting, you want to gradually wean the student away from that 
physical prompting. Also, it is important to note down on your monitoring chart that you are using physical prompting because when you're using physical prompting, most of the work is not done so much by the student, but by the person who is the enabler at that time to complete that task. So it is important, especially if it is your pair educator who is working with the student, it is important for you to train the pair uh, educator in terms of understanding that using physical prompting or hand over hand prompting is very highly invasive and the student is doing very little to contribute to add to his knowledge. So these are some important things for you to uh, remember. And, uh, as I mentioned uh, in my previous seminar, that the one focusing on literacy, um, when we are working with students with significant cognitive communication and motor needs, we want to make sure that the learning is accessible to the learner and the learner is actively engaged and the learner has a way to present uh, whatever he has learned. So that's the universal design for learning. And the other important thing is if the student is not able to fully participate in an, in an activity, the student is at least completing some of the steps in the activity. That is your concept of partial participation. If the student is not able to lift, the, for example, the spoon all the way up, or if, if you are teaching the student about counting the number of spoons, maybe you put an adapted cup around his hand and you attach with Velcro some of the spoons on that adapted cuff so that he can look at it or she can look at it and maybe get an idea that, oh, I don't have one spoon, but I have two spoons attached to my uh, adapted cuff. And so you want to make sure that the activities are engaging and interactive, just like the one I mentioned now. And always Technology can be used to provide not only a voice for the student, but also a way for the student to be able to communicate his needs, his wants, or, or to participate as part of a group or as a team uh, in a group activity. And one of my favorite things is we want to make sure that the activities and the materials we use are age appropriate for the learner. Because when we are working with students at the high school level, it's important that we are not using materials like the plastic bears that preschool children use to count. They can count spoons, they can count uh, pennies, but not necessarily using, using materials that are at the preschool level is kind of demeaning to the student. UDL guidelines, the, the, uh, the goal, the vision for UDL, Universal Design for Learning, is we want to use flexible methods of presentation. In other words, we use PowerPoint presentation, we use adapted books. Let's say, um, um, let's say we are working on the concept of number sense and counting. So can we make a book that and attach objects to the book. I will show an illustration of that later on in one of the slides so that the student can feel and touch and particularly if the student is visually impaired, it adds that tactile sense. Or if you need sound producing objects for a, uh, for a student who is blind, then can you use little balls or little bells that make a sound and attach it or put it inside a mini plastic bag so that you increase the engagement. And do you, you want to make sure the student has multiple ways to express himself. It may be through technology, it may be through pointing, it may be through gesture, it may be through touching. And um, you, you want to use a PowerPoint presentation. For example, you are doing a number sense. Again, you can do a PowerPoint presentation for those who can see, uh, and uh, you, know, you can make up a little story about naming one of the students in your class and say on Monday for following these preschool story, but 
presented in a much more uh, universal age neutral sense, say, okay, on Monday, uh, Brian had one donut. On Tuesday, Brian had two donuts. And on Wednesday, he had three donuts, you know, something like that, and make it like a PowerPoint presentation, make it like a story so that they have, they connect with that learning and the engagement level increases. And you can print out those slides and give it to the students and you can attach either pictures of the donuts or you can put something like, uh, if it's not donut, you can make it like an M&M &M and put a little one M&M &M inside a mini plastic bag and attach it to the book. And that way they can feel the M&M, &M, they can look at the picture, and they can connect it to the abstract concept of the number one, number two, number three. So this is kind of an organizer that you can use so that you know what kind of learning objectives you're going to be addressing in that particular activity. Is it going to be, we are going to be talking about number sense, we are going to be talking about measurement concept, we are going to be talking about patterns and uh, graphing, we are going to be talking about money, which is most often the concept that's, that is very uh, universally addressed in many of the classrooms serving students with uh, significant uh, learning challenges. So what kind of learning objectives are you going to address connected to the core concept of measurement or number sense or patterns or something like that? Then what kind of adaptations are you going to be using? What kind of supports? What ideas are you going to use to teach? Because one of the important things that we need to remember is while we want to repeat the activity multiple times in order to build the student's self-confidence and proficiency, leading to proficiency, um, you also want to make sure you use a variety of activities to teach that same concept and you also use novel materials and diverse materials instead of bringing out, let's say, the pennies every time to count or bringing in the spoons to count, how about using a variety of materials so that that brings in the novelty which increases the motivation level, that increases engagement leading to new learning. And you also want to make sure that you connect it with best. Do you remember we counted spoons yesterday. And the other thing that I want to mention here before I forget, you know, we have a tendency to go sometimes all the way to 10 or all the way to 20, let's say, in number sense. But sometimes our student is not able to reach that level, so we need to adjust that task complexity and say, okay, you know what? We are going to be starting with two, two things and then move on to three, then move on to maybe five. So we have to make sure we adjust that task complexity level. And all of that would be addressed in that learning objective. So do begin with a clear vision of where you want to go with your learning objective, connecting it to the core concept. And you want to make sure you break it down. As I just mentioned, you may want your goal may be that the student is able to count 10 objects at the end of the year, but you want to begin with maybe two things or even one thing. And, uh, and some of the things, let's say your student is working on counting, uh, counting skills, and he, you have two baskets, and the student has to drop a bean bag into a basket. The student may have significant motor need, and so you may use an adapted glove with Velcro on it, and the student, and you may attach the bean bag to that so that partially, and the student drops that bean bag either using some kind of a uh, adapted grasp or an adapted tool to drop that one bean bag in that so that and then you point to the one basket without any bean bag and the one basket with the bean bag and the student makes the connection that is one and you match it with the numeral one and you use variety of different activities to con you know teach that concept one and nothing uh, and then 
you provide maybe assistive technology to enable that com communication. And of course, as I mentioned before, practice, practice, practice more in a variety of settings, maybe in the school cafeteria, maybe in the vending machine, maybe when you are going on a school trip, when you are outside in the playground, when you are at recess, uh, uh, all of these provide you opportunities to do a different types of activities that you can do. They may count the trees. They may compare two trees and say this one is shorter, this one is taller. So the variety of ways you can engage your students and connect with the prior knowledge. And when you are teaching a concept, try and see if you can use uh, kind of not only novel items, but some items that the student may prefer and you have established hopefully by this time what the student prefers and then use that as a medium, as, a, as the material to teach your students. And always make sure that it has relevance for daily life because especially for students with significant needs, what we are trying to do is to increase their self-dependence, increase their ability to be able to connect with the real world so that they can be as independent as possible. And as I mentioned, we want items that are multi-sensory in nature because it connects with the brain immediately. So you want objects to touch, you want objects that they can smell, the objects that they can hear, sound producing objects. So a variety of tools that are multi-sensory in nature are connected with the math concepts. And the other thing that I do want to mention is when we are placing materials, we want to make sure that the materials are not always placed at the table level or the desk level. We have to make sure, depending on if the student is sitting in a wheelchair or if the student is placed in a stander and you are having the math lesson, you want to make sure that the materials are at the eye level. That's one thing. So you can use either a sandboard board or you can use some kind of a mini whiteboard and attach objects to that for them to be able to see. The other thing is uh, you, if a student is able to look at his desk and you can place the objects on his desk or on his table, on the table, then what you want to make sure is the the accidentally the student is not moving away the object as he is counting, as he is touching, or as he is measuring. You want to make sure that they are either placed on a Dyson mat or they are placed on some kind of a shelf liner material so that you, um, you see that the student is not ac accidentally pushing away the materials. So you want to make sure that the uh, objects are placed. And the, we are going to go ahead and begin with one of the first core concepts that's usually addressed uh, in, uh, at most levels, a number sense. What is the purpose of that? First of all, number sense is frequently used in a variety of settings. And it, we want to focus on the student gaining mathematical awareness so that he can use numbers in a variety of ways. Maybe we take the student to the grocery store and the student counts three items and places it on the counter for the cashier to check. Or the student says, you know, I am going to pay $3 for this item and he counts out $3, uh, three different dollar bills. Uh, the student says, you know, I want to have two spoons, one for my dessert and one for my main meal. So you want to make sure you embed opportunities to count in a variety of real life situations, both in the classroom and out of the classroom. One of the things that you can do to help is you can place a number line. I call it a number list. And um, instead of having it all the way to 20, all the way to 10, maybe you want to reduce it to 1 to 3 or 1 to 5. And maybe you can try and attach objects 
to that, and I'll show you an illustration at a later slide. Uh, and or and in addition, you can make a kind of a counting wall. One of the questions, for example, that came up at the last literacy webinar is, when do we have the time to make these kind of materials? And that's a very valid question. What I would do is have a group of students, and they themselves help you to make some of these materials. If you're making a counting uh, book, if you're making a counting wall, your student who can count up to eight objects puts the eight objects in a little bag or a little Ziploc bag. Another student who can count one object puts it in a Ziploc bag or in a mini plastic bag into that object, and then you attach it to your wall. And that way you are using your students. And the, also the other option is to use your peer mentors who come in to help you. They can help you, for example, make the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, uh, if they are at the middle school or the high school level, they can certainly help you with putting together the PowerPoint presentation for teaching counting. Um, and one of the other techniques that you would use is you act out the story problem. Uh, for example, you can have students and say, okay, Brian, we are going to give Brian spoons. Okay, so Tom gives Brian one spoon, Susie gives two spoons, and Andrea gives three spoons, and you actually act it out so that they have they are given a set of let's say four or five spoons and they actually go and give the spoons to Brian and when the physical movement is involved they are acting it out they are more likely to remember and it is far more engagement not only for the student you are trying to teach but it's a it's a lesson for everybody together and then of course another tool that you can use uh, is a giant display calculator i think that's available from attainment company and a talking calculator so that you can they can pair that and I'm also going to show you a way you can use the uh, I talk to a communicator from AbleNet to teach uh, numbers. Um, so you use multiple tools and you make the adaptation so that the, it's, it's like you, they're watching a drama and because they are watching a drama it's far more exciting to learn. So these are some of the pictures. For example, there is a tray there, and in that tray, uh, the numbers are placed, and so this is one-to-one -one correspondence, you could say. This is also, you can say, matching numerals to objects. You can use it in a variety of ways, and they drop the objects in the tray, uh, and they can also do it to match numerals to counting. And the other example that I have shown there, that's again numerals to object matching, and you will see in those mini plastic bags, you will see those jingle bells, and there is one, and particularly the reason why I chose is frequently when I go into classrooms and providing support to the teachers or others, what I find, some of them say, you know, my student puts everything in his or her mouth. So this mini plastic bags, you know, fully closed with the object inside, and these jingle bells can, be, you know, it's a more age neutral item. You can also use these little mini ice cream spoons that can also be uh, age neutral. And then you attach uh, these objects, either you can attach it to the um, number list on the desk, desk, or you can do it as a separate thing like the way I have shown in this picture. And the next slide shows, um, what am I, what's happening? The next slide shows the uh, accounting wall. And so they are doing that and every day as, as part of your just immediately after your uh, uh, calendar activities or something like that, when you have just a couple of minutes, you have your students, you know, you take out all the mini bags that are attached uh, and matched to the numbers and they practice it. And any time that you have a few minutes, 
they do that. So it's kind of a routine activity, but at the same time, it's repeated practice. And then they, you can combine it with other activities that also reinforce the counting. Uh, then in order to engage your learner, uh, using assistive technology, which provides also a voice for them. And you can program this as an iTalk to communicator, and it can just say one or two, uh, or the number one and number two. And you can also match it with, uh, with those mini bags and then place that mini bag right in front of the I talk to communicator and then you can or you can attach it to the mini communicator and say one jingle bell or one spoon and two spoons and what we are doing here we are expanding object awareness we are uh, increasing numeral recognition we are teaching counting skills which is number sense we are also increasing the students communication and his knowledge about the world this is particularly relevant for a student with the most significant and sign uh, severe cognitive uh, need the you can also see another picture that is the form dies and particularly for students who are at the preschool setting or in the early elementary setting, you would find these foam dyes that you can get at the dollar store is a great tool because not only can you use it to count the dots and place them in sequence as I have demonstrated there, as I have illustrated there, you can also play a variety of games. One thing is they can count one dot and two dots together, how many do they make? So you can use it to teach addition. You can also use it if you have a student who is at a higher functioning level to multiply. But because of the concrete item, it has a far more appeal. And then also you can play a game. They can uh, uh, throw the dice, the foam dice, and the number that you know, uh, that you get when you throw the dice, uh, they, they have to identify how many dots. So it's kind of far more fun. And when you play a game, you are increasing the motivation level rather than say, count and tell me how many dots there are. Uh, instead, if they throw the dice, it's, it increases uh, the motivation. So and the other picture that you see is the concrete items attached to the counting, um, counting book. Here, this is another example. This is maybe at the preschool level. You can use this as a matching activity. Again, uh, they are matching textures, or you can use it to match shapes. Uh, uh, you can use it to teach shapes. Uh, you can use it to just teach matching. This is a bingo game that you can play, and I, I want to suggest two things. If your student is at a level where Looking at six numbers, they would get confused, and it is too complex. You can adjust the complexity level, and you can divide that into just two sections with two numbers. In other words, you can play this game with maybe half a dozen students, or six students, or four students, or, um, um, and then you can have a different game board for each student depending on the student's skill level. But what they're doing, they are identifying the number, and you can play, call out the number. I am thinking of the number four, or I am thinking of four uh, straws. I am thinking of four pennies point to the number four, or if you have the number four, show it. And then they cover up that, they find number four, and then they cover up the number four. And so you can play a bingo game, and again, it increases numeral identification while they are having fun. And again, the students themselves can glue the numbers on with a glue stick so that they themselves can be your helpers if they have the motor uh, skills to do that. Or you can, of course, use peer mentors. And now, how can we use assistive technology uh, to enable. The 
picture that you see on the left side, the alternate spinner, I have found it's a lot of fun. It's, it doesn't have a voice. However, it can be connected to a switch and the spinner spins and the you can do it a variety of ways. Here I have taken the picture from the AbleNet and so it has numbers attached, but instead you can actually have objects attached to that and you, you can reduce, you know, this one has six numerals there. Instead you can make it four numerals or four mini bags uh, glued to, uh, I mean, uh, Velcro to the uh, alternate spinners. They give you those kind of uh, circular cards that comes with it. And then um, you can attach it. And then the number that the spinner points to, they have to match it or they have to count out that many and give the teacher or they have to give it to their uh, partner who is playing with them in that game. So you can use that to play games, identify, uh, and it can even be advanced to the next level. You can say quarter, half, and a whole and just have three things, and then you can again attach concrete items to go with that. This particular alternate spinner, because it adds that element of a game, it's, it's a lot of fun for students. Um, the other one that you see is the to super talker, and what you can do is at the top, where the pictures are there, you can place and, you know, pictures of one, uh, one apple, two apples, three apples, four apples, and at the bottom, the numerals, and as they press, they can uh, hear the numeral, or they can say one apple, two apples. So it's kind of something that they can practice on their own, or you can use it for a group activity uh, because it does have the facility uh, to have a number of uh, people participating using the super talker. So many of these things, you are repeating the same core concept, which is number sense, but a variety of ways you are presenting the material, so it increases their uh, learning opportunities. This one we are moving on to addition. Again, how do we present addition using concrete materials? How do we connect the concrete with the abstract? So you are moving from the concrete, and then you move on to the representational, as you see in those circles, green circles, um, and then you show the actual abstract numeral. So in order to reach all learners and to quickly reach them, you want to use as much as possible the concrete. Again, another example of how do you set up the, and in the bottom example, what you do is you play, you, you place the cards or the green card that has the numeral one plus numeral two, and how much does it equal? And then the student has to find an object and place that match that object to that numeral and practices uh, placing that object and completes a num builds that number sen sentence or completes that number sentence. Here we are moving on to the money skills. How do we use money and how can we use money in the real world? Um, your students may be working at different levels. Some of them may be using combinations of coins and bills. Some of them are learning that money is used to buy something. So that's the transfer that exchange that occurs. And uh, for some, it may be just a matter of a social communication when you set up some kind of a simulated store as this example or this photograph shows. Uh, so you are going to teach the money concept. Some of you may be already doing this, having a simulated uh, store in your classroom. But in the beginning, the only thing I suggest is instead of having 10 items, have two or three items and make sure your students master uh, this money concept using 
simplified simulated store because you are adjusting the task complexity level and then they become comfortable and then you can increase uh, because errors will dis decrease and their competence will increase and their proficiency will improve. So this is another example. So I have listed a number of learning objectives there. So some students may be understanding that money is what is used to pay for an item. Some students in your classroom, maybe one or two, will know that they have to, they want to buy an item, they have to pay for an item. And some, again one or two, may be exchanging the right amount that the item costs and then pay for that item to buy the item uh, in your simulated stores. And some others may be able to identify when they go on your CBI trip and you are going to the grocery store to buy the items for a cooking activity to be able to associate the items, the cost of the items, pay for the items, a variety of things can be addressed in this concept of money in the real world. So I mentioned already a several uh, learning objectives and as I said, you know, some will identify the dollar bill and some of your students with the most significant cognitive needs, they are maybe making a choice between two items that are sold at that simulated store. And some others will learn that they are paying, paying a dollar. And in the beginning, again, I would suggest that make two sets of items, let's say you have, let's say four items, two items cost a dollar, whereas two other items cost just 50 cents. Or in the, if you have serve students who have the most significant needs in your classroom in a self-contained setting, you may in the beginning want to make all of the items just dollar maybe, but they are just learning. And then within two weeks, you can add the 50 cent item to that simulated stores. So you are always looking at your students' needs and you are adjusting the task complexity level and within the same simulated store, you are trying to reach different learners at different levels. So some are just coming to the simulated store and they are looking at the cashier who is one of your students and they are actually uh, making eye contact with that person and they understand that they make a choice between two items and that increases their engagement and communication. That may be the only thing they may be doing at the beginning and later on they may be making a choice to, uh, to buy one of the items in the store. So we are moving on uh, to the measurement concept. Again, measurement can involve size, ordering items by size or uh, uh, quantity in terms of less and more. Again, some of the tools that I suggested previously, you know, you give them, for example, a mini board. On that mini board you have, on the left side, you have a Ziploc bag with less number of items. And on the right side, you have another Ziploc bag with more, and they have to be able to identify less and more. And one of the things that I think would be a lot of fun for your student is weighing different items. And again, you can have different students. Some students are just placing an item on the scale, whereas some other students may be actually telling you uh, how much an item weighs. And somebody, some other students may be saying, this is between one and three pounds. And so if you have an index card with one pound, index card with three pounds, and they match it to the scale. So there are a variety of ways they can uh, participate and engage and demonstrate their competence in that activity. And one of the things, we always do calendars in most of our cal classrooms, but seldom do we take them immediately during the calendar time outside to check out the temperature. So that's something you can do and your student can make the connection between the outside temperature and the inside temperature and some of them can even glue a, a yellow dot on that uh, temperature for the day. 
So the other thing is time and clock that also comes under measurement. And again, we want students to be able to relate an activity to the specific time. And this is something you can routinely do. Uh, and another student who is at a pretty high level can maybe set the timer, a stopwatch, and kind of you know, be able to share uh, how long a particular activity took. So you can adjust that. Somebody may say, okay, it's 11 a.m., and so it's time for lunch, and they may be showing the lunch card, or they may be pressing their Big Mac and say lunch time at 11 o'clock when you say 11 o'clock, whereas some others may be using the uh, stopwatch and setting a timer for an activity. And they can measure three lengths three different lengths of yarn. They can measure different measurement tools and what they are used. A ruler, what is it used for? Or you can also do a kind of a role play at that time, who is taller, who is shorter, and then they can identify the tall person and the uh, comparatively shorter person. So uh, next we are moving on to patterns. By the way, patterns is very much evident in music, as you know. So that's why it is important for many, many of our students to engage in music and uh, kind of, you could say, play with musical instruments and kind of beat out a rhythm because they are all based on patterns. It also teaches them that there is pattern in nature. And you can also use art as a medium to teach patterns. You know, you, you, you have the daytime, and that's always followed by nighttime. And then you have patterns in seasons. And we'll be looking at a little bit more about these patterns in nature and kind of the seasons. A little bit we'll be touching on in the next webinar on science. Because all of these things, science, literacy, and math, they are really linked together. We are teaching abstract concepts through concrete experiences. Uh, and also what patterns does, it's very critical for improving the thinking skills and the cognitive skills of all learners and certainly learners with learning challenges. So they, will, they may be exploring and feeling the pattern. Some of, some of your students may be actually completing a pattern uh, that you have started. And some others may be actually creating a pattern. So these are some examples. For example, two, four, six, eight, and you start off the model for them, and they use the blocks or spoons or straws, and they complete the pattern. pattern. For others, for the younger children, they can use it uh, like the demonstrated, illustrated example uh, using shapes. Uh, those are form shapes that you can build a pattern. One thing that I would like to mention here is, you know, most of us, uh, we like to decorate our bulletin board, and students can stamp patterns on kind of on a sentence strip, for example, and you can attach the student created pattern on your uh, bulletin board as a bordette. And that will increase their sense of through and sense of accomplishment for your students. The example on the right, uh, that is more age appropriate for a middle school, high school. It can also use it at the upper elementary, but uh, this is a little bit maybe more complicated. And the students themselves can create that pattern. It's a product and a cost pattern. So one brush costs $2, and you can instead use a T-shirt maybe. Uh, one T-shirt costs $2. I don't think you can get maybe $5. And then two T-shirts will cost how much, and then they gradually increase, and you increase the number of items, and then they have to figure out that there is a pattern that follows. So that's another way to teach patterns. The, all these are things to make learning motivating and bringing math closer to them so that they don't, uh, you know, they don't fear math as something abstract. And this one is an example 
of a graphing activity that you can do, and that is uh, the students vote on their kind of favorite leisure activity. Uh, so, you know, you have the names of the students on the left hand side, and then you ask, do you watch videos? And you can use, is actually use an example as a video and say, how many people like to watch videos in their leisure time? How many, how many of you like time with friends? How many of you like to listen to music? How many of you like to play video games? And how many of you like to just play sports? So, and then they vote on it. You can give them these kind of foam shapes. And this graphing chart has Velcro attached on it. Uh, so you can have Velcro attached so that they come and vote. You can, they can bring that shape and post that shape on that graphic. And at that time, you can put the Velcro. And these foam shapes also will have Velcro so that you can attach it there. And then they get to count. I know it's a very simple counting activity, but they get to see the illustration of a graph, and they get to see a comparison of who liked music who like time with friends, and then which is more, which is less. So a number of, concept, number of concepts, skills are embedded within this particular activity. And again, it's object awareness, and you are increasing engagement and communication while you are building the student's math uh, concept and um, awareness and increasing their cognitive skills as well. And then you can also you combine it with like they can place blocks. So time with friends was four blocks and they can place it one on top of each other and they can uh, do that as, a, as, a, as an additional activity to go with that. A, as we conclude, uh, there are a couple of things that I do want to mention. I have repeatedly mentioned that, but I do. Our focus is always on how do we increase access, engagement, and the student to respond. So we have to make sure the activities that we are presenting are accessible to the learners so that they can touch, whether they have visual impairment, they can feel it. For a student who has a hearing impairment, can they can touch and feel the object. And the feeling and touching will increase their understanding as well. And we are always using functional activities that have real life application. And these are hands-on activities so that it has immediate attraction for them. The other thing I do want to mention as a recommended practice is we want to make sure that the support that we provide during the activity, either from the educator uh, in terms of the teacher or the parent educator, is, uh, is minimal support and it is not too intrusive. In other words, we are not always, when the student does not respond to the question, we need to make sure we not only provide week time, we want to make sure we want to use as minimally as possible hands, hand over hand prompting because then the student is really not engaging in the activity, it is the adult who is engaging. And so we want to make sure that prompting is gradually faded and the student is able to complete the activity or at least partially participate in that activity. And we do make sure that there is uh, systematic instruction and prompt the progress monitoring. And then if the student is not learning, we may have to either change the materials or break down the task and simplify it. And we want to then again reassess. As, as, I as, sorry, as I said right at the beginning, we are constantly focused on learner independence and that the student uh, is able to complete as much of the task as possible independently without adult assistance. So some of the sources from where I have taken, actually I would say mainly uh, 
the main source is from my own book, Serving Students with Severe and Multiple Disabilities, that gave me uh, a, a lot of ideas for this math webinar. And there are other books like The Striking a Balance that's for students with moderate to severe disabilities that also has a lot of adaptation ideas. Uh, and then uh, AbleNet has a curriculum called the Equals Curriculum that also has a lot of adaptations and ideas and strategies that you can use. And of course, the UDL website, it's all in your PowerPoint. As we close, I do have some time. I certainly answer, answer your uh, chat questions. Uh, the next webinar is on science. Even though we think of it as science, it is as much linked to literacy, communication, student engagement, object awareness, and all of these things. Because ideally, what we want to do with students with severe and multiple disabilities is to increase their communication, increase their choice making, increase their object awareness, and increase their concept knowledge. And all of that will happen in that uh, science. And both science and math, and particularly science, can be very exciting for the learner because we can use a lot of functional and hands-on real-life activities. So I am ready to take on any chat questions that you have. So if you have chat questions, go ahead and type them in. And I don't see uh, do I know? Okay, I do have. Okay, the the question is, do you have do you know of any math curriculum in software form that would be good for students that have very limited motor control? I am not aware of any math curriculum that's available in a software form, uh, but uh, I mean the equals curriculum from AbleNet, I'm sure has multiple adaptation for students with mo uh, limited motor skills. And at the same time, you would find that the instructional organized organizer pages in my book on severe disabilities, you just have to print it out and that has numerous adaptations for students with motor skills difficulties as well as cognitive uh, difficulties. It shows that there, there are pages called the cluster support pages and those, those pages show those adaptations. Um, if there is no other question, I would say thank you very much and uh, have a good afternoon or good morning wherever you are. And I look forward to seeing you again at the Science Stimulates webinar, uh, Active Engagement to Arouse Learners, that is on November 3rd. And uh, thank you very much to AbleNet for um, offering this opportunity for all of us to engage in the stimulating discussion uh, in this webinar. Thank you to AbleNet, and thank you to the participants for joining the webinar.